authors, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs. Listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. And joining me today is going to be Alejandro Dominguez, a.k.a. the Dead Explorer. And this gentleman travels the world in search of ghosts. And he puts a lot of videos up on YouTube. He's running his own uh, Kickstarter series. He's going to tell us a little something more about that. Now, I think he had somebody who was going to join him on that that uh, wasn't able to make it or something. He said something to me about it in uh, Skype earlier. I'll let him explain that to you because I'm probably messing it up, to be honest with you. But if you want to learn more about him, his website is www.deadexplorer.com. And uh, would you all excuse me for just one quick moment? I apologize for that, folks. Uh, At any rate, what I was going to say... For those of you that are listening at YouTube or iTunes or somewhere else, we got some people showing up in chat now. We'd love to have more. The more the merrier, the more fun we can have. I uh, want to invite everybody to come over to www.talknowradio.com, uh, get a free membership, and join in and talk with everybody else who's already there now. We'd be happy to have you. If you all want to call in and ask questions, the number is uh, 832-632-7904. Or if you're in the chat, you can just ask that way. Skype users, y'all could uh, PM Mr. Paranormal, and y'all can ask me questions on Skype. So, uh, Alejandro, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, Royce. I'm really excited to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Well, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank you for getting a hold of me and let me know you had something to share with my listeners. Uh, I always like to keep my listeners informed of the latest news that's going on out in the paranormal community. Now, I think you were telling me um, when you first got a hold of me about some new Kickstarter thing you had going on, but you said you wouldn't be able to go into detail on it today. Can you share anything about it at all today? Oh, yeah, I definitely can. It, it, the Kickstarter campaign was something that I started uh, now about 27 days ago, and Kickstarter is basically a way to raise funds for filmmaking or any kind of creative project you want to involve, be involved with. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've done Dead Explorer, my paranormal web series. It's basically a show where I travel across the United States. I've been to North Carolina, uh, all over Texas, which is my home state, so you're going to see a lot of Texas. But I've also been to Arizona, California, uh, pretty much traveled over 15,000 miles last year trying to capture paranormal activity at some of the most haunted places in the United States. And, and so the Kickstarter was a, uh, an effort uh, to, to raise some funds because it's completely self-financed. And, uh, you know, the whole first year, every, everywhere I went, it's, 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 a, a pa- you know, it's a labor of passion. I love the paranormal. I love filmmaking. Uh, but the Kickstarter was, was a way to maybe see if, if, if we can get a little bit further, see a few more people um, in, in 2014. And that's something that's going to end in three days. I'm not really sure if we're going to meet the goal. It's all or nothing. Um, but uh, even if we don't meet the Kickstarter, you, you can be for certain that I'm going to be out there still investigating and still putting up stuff up on YouTube. Now, your show you do, is that broadcast mo- mostly at YouTube, or is that just where you post after your main show? You have another site people can go to to catch you live, or how does that work? Um, with Dead Explorer, uh, the first season, which is about 42 episodes, it was all exclusively on YouTube. And the great thing about YouTube is if anybody likes the, the video, they can share it. So, you know, it, the episodes have appeared all over the Internet. Uh, I keep DeadExplorer.com as a home where uh, I, I do blogging and I put uh, updates on, on stuff in between the episodes. So that's a cool way to kind of catch the in-between stuff when, when an episode's not out there. Uh, obviously, uh, Dex, uh, Facebook, uh, Dead Explorer on Facebook and, and, and Google Plus is also the same, just more updates about stuff between the show. Uh, season two, I'm really looking forward to doing some full linked episodes. In fact, I'm, I'm editing, uh, a 50 minute episode right now. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, on, on, the, on YouTube, my episodes are about five, six minutes long. These, uh, 50 minute long episodes will probably be on Roku and Amazon, uh, on demand so people can still watch them, uh, on their, on their computers, their tablets, their cell phones, or on, or on their TVs. 
Well, if you don't mind me getting a quick plug in for myself there, Alejandro, I have a section that I do my archives in right here on my site where I take your, uh, my uh, guest picture and my picture and put it into my DVD player, or my DVD maker, or movie maker, I mean, and add this, our show sound file and turn it into a sort of a video, and I upload it to my section that's like YouTube right here that uh, it's so much like YouTube that it gives you a link that you can share on your site or embed my shows on your site. And I just didn't know if a lot of people may not be aware of that in case they wanted to share my shows elsewhere. And I've also got a section on it. I've got it turned off right now where people can post their own shows like you could post yours if you wanted to. But I, I, I'd have to turn it back on. I just didn't know if there would be many people wanting to, you know, actually add theirs to the deal. And I've been using it for my archive. But I could set aside a category, you know, for my show and let everything else run in other categories. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But um, I thought I'd throw that in there real quick while you were mentioning it, because a lot of people may not be aware of that. And, it could, you know, some people I know would love to be able to share uh, shows on their site and might want to share their shows, because I know you, you've you got a big channel over there. You've been doing that thing for quite some time. Uh, I did, Roy. I have been, Royce. And, and, and obviously, I'll also follow up what you just said. Uh, you know, I discovered you on YouTube, and uh, I think you're a great presence on YouTube. I know that you're always uh, out there talking to different people in the paranormal field and, and, and not just one particular field, but you're basically getting all the different views and perspectives and a lot of different paranormal categories. And I, I really appreciate your show for that. And, uh, and I am, uh, you know, been working on the YouTube content for a while. The Explorer is um, basically it started in about 2011 uh, with just paranormal videos uh, or paranormal investigation videos. You know, no no night vision cameras, just basically uh, trying to see what I could capture with my eyes and ears and uh, just having a, a camera in case there's something that the camera can catch. And from that it, it, it just grew, uh, you know, before I did that Explorer, I have always been into the paranormal, but I've also been into filmmaking. And for about two years, I was putting up other type of content that's on YouTube as well. So uh, if you add that all up, uh, you know, there's been probably over 100 videos on YouTube. Uh, but that Explorer is, is, is basically what I focus on now. It, it just brings all my passions together and and. and um, it's just something that basically, you know, the moment I wake up every day, I think a lot of parent people can relate to this. Uh, you know, I'm thinking paranormal, so I, I love it. So this is more of a, uh, a work of passion than it is a, a work of corporation for you. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, who doesn't want to do what they love for a living? And so if, if one day Dead Explorer be, was a, was a means to that, for sure I'd be interested. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not a cash grab. It's not to try to be a famous or a celebrity. Uh, you know, I work, uh, Monday through Friday. I, I work a, uh, uh, for a nonprofit in Austin. And, um, and, and then I add, you know, another 40 hours a week at nine and the weekends on, on Dead Explorer. If, if it would be the same thing, where I could do that Monday through Friday, I, I'd take it. But it's, it starts with the passion. That's what keeps me going. That's what motivates me to do it every day. Otherwise, you know, you can sustain a, a show like the Explorer by yourself for, for, you know, over a year if you really weren't into it and if you weren't really, uh, you know, passionate about the paranormal. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, uh, I've been doing my show for like seven years now, and I think I'm pretty well qualified to be able to say that it takes a lot uh you know, me and you talked at the very beginning of how we're both one-man shows. And a one-man show means that, uh, well, in my case, I have to go look for guests to put on my show. I have to check out their material, make sure they're not just some scam running out there. And they, they've got good content that people would actually want to be knowing about. I have to actually um, post them to my site. And then I have to go promote them. When I had to uh, contact the person, I had to schedule them. I had to <laughs> do the actual show. <coughs> Please pardon me for that, folks. I, something scratched my throat suddenly. I didn't mean to do that uh, on the air. At any rate, like I say, there's so many different things involved 
that you wouldn't be doing it without some kind of passion or if you weren't getting paid a paycheck for it or nobody goes to that much trouble without one or the other being a reason or some kind of motivation, in other words. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you nailed there, right? There's, there, you know, sometimes you hope it can, you know, you can do what you love and maybe it would be both. But, um, you know, the I think you're right. It's, it's, it's not just uh, the content. It's all the work that goes into the content, calling places uh, to go investigate. Uh, I've, you know, I've driven uh, multiple locations over 15 miles just to go, uh, you know, to a place that I really want to investigate outside of Texas. And, um, you know, you just can't fake your know, passion for that. You know, um, I, I think people can see that. People can see if somebody, you know, they can see if somebody's trying to uh, get a quick buck or somebody's just trying to become famous. And I think part of what uh, I love about the show is the people who support it, the people who are who have become my friends uh, over the over the years, just, you know, messaging me, you know, asking questions you know, going back and forth about the paranormal. Um, I, I, that's what I enjoy about the show, that that's real. And that's not, and I don't think that would happen if people were like, oh, this guy is just trying to exploit the paranormal to become famous. Um, uh, and, and, and so I, I love that that's the, that the, the show is real. The interaction with the people is real. And, and to me, that's one of the most rewarding aspects of it all is that, that, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's grassroots grown with other people who are into the same thing that I like. And, and eventually a lot of them I get to meet. And, uh, I've worked with nine paranormal groups over the last year who just met me through YouTube, said, Hey, let's, if you can find a way, let's make it out to us. And I, and I did it. And, um, and these are some of my best friends now too. Yeah, you travel all over the world, so I take it you'll probably go to Louisiana sometime down the road. Well, it should be uh, definitely on the agenda. Uh, being in, in Austin, you know, it's a short drive uh, to I-10 into into Louisiana. It, it, a lot of there's a lot of different things that go into uh, choosing uh, a location. Uh, you know, as a, as a one man show the, the producer the editor and everything uh you know what really helps me is if i can go to a place where you know i have other paranormal friends who you know would want to be on the show that way it's it, it, it's logistically easier to do and obviously uh find a holiday <laughs> location that that would would want us you know and obviously Louisiana is very famous on the map for its paranormal activity uh so i think all the le- elements should be there I, sh- I should definitely make it happen soon right well, you know, I was kind of setting you up. I hope you don't mind. Um, and just so happens, if you look in the chat room, and don't turn the player on because they will get an echo if you do, but uh, you'll see there's a guy in there called Cajun Ghost Hunter. He's been one of my guests recently, and he's going to be on the show again in October. And he travels all over Louisiana, and he gets CVPs, and he investigates all the haunts. And I thought if you were heading that way, you and him would like to hook up. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm actually looking at some of the uh, the messages. I see Mr. Cajun Ghost Hunter, and if he's interested in in, in reaching out to me, um, you know, the best way might be uh, Facebook.com forward slash The Explorer. You know, you can message me, or uh, maybe after the show, you can help me get his info, and we can connect. Oh, yeah. He, you're both on Facebook, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you're both on uh, YouTube, so y'all should be able to have a easy time uh you know connecting i've got two gems in that chat room right now so i'm gonna go call uh the one of them uh genocide if i uh type into the deal i thought i'd let him know if i because uh, any other time i put genocide in there he'd say well you know i'm james <laughs> 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 let him know why i'm doing it okay but, yeah at any rate i just think you uh i've had um well, his name's Stanley Jolay, uh, Jolay, I think is how it's pronounced. He's actually been on my show before. He was a fantastic guest, and I think there's a good chance that you two might really work pretty well together. Uh, do you do EVPs as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. When we're at, when we're out in an investigation, um, I'm, I'm definitely trying to capture any kind of uh, you know evidence. That I can that I can support, you know, with 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 equipment or what have you. So yeah, I've captured many of EBPs uh, during uh, an investigation, and uh, you know, some of them make it on the show. Some of them I don't share because um, you know it, it, I have a hard time validating 
uh, if I can't validate an AVP as far as I'm 100% certain it wasn't any of us, then I usually don't share it. So I have many AVPs in my own personal library, and then they're the ones that I feel so good, so confident about that I put out on the show, and, and, and some of those have been absolutely awesome. I know that um, Cajun Ghost Hunter recently did my wife a favor and tried to get an EBP of her mother. And the uh, um, only thing, information he asked me to give him was her mother's name. And with that, when he got an EBP back on her, the EBP actually, when asked how many kids she had, replied she had four kids, which is exactly what my wife's uh, mother had was four kids. Wow. That's, that's an excellent uh, capture. Well, that pretty well impressed. And then it went on to say, uh, mention uh, Rick, which is one of her ex-husbands. Oh. So my so, wife liked to so freak. So like an, an intelligent <laughs> response, basically. It sounds like two intelligent responses in a row. Yeah, which that, uh, that's uh, an automatic uh, eye-opener from what I'm giving to understand. Well, it's definitely... Um, Another layer to 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 the to the evidence, you know, a lot of times you go out and you capture uh, some audio and you, you know, try to share it and people are going to make up their own minds whether or not they personally believe it's it's evidence of something paranormal. Um, but a lot of times, you know, um, if you can have an intelligent response, something that uh, that shows in real interaction with, a, with an entity, uh, obviously that's that's. That makes things more credible, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's still everybody's personal opinion about whether or not they they want to believe. And some people are always gonna, uh, you know, no matter how good Devin's is, is, is choose to not to believe. And there's always gonna be people out there with open minds uh, who are gonna want to. But hey, it's everybody's prerogative. No, no, no right. There's no right or wrong in the paranormal. That is true. But I have heard stories, especially Ed Shanahan once told me that he took a skeptic out there that didn't believe in ghosts at all, that wanted to go out there and just prove to him that he was wrong, they didn't exist, and just pick apart everything that he did during the investigation. Mm -hmm. And he said that one of the ghosts or something had evidently touched him, and this guy like to flew out of his skin and took off running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing that will turn a skeptic into a believer faster than uh, taking them out on an investigation and having you know some, some good activity happen uh you know and it, it's i mean in some cases it's also a little hit or miss because you know with all the investigations i've done i've been to places like uh the birdcage theater in tombstone arizona it's been on all the tv shows it's ever you know it's really famous in, in the paranormal community as one of the most haunted places in the united states and on that particular night I, I captured nothing not a single not a single thing um so it's always funny uh you know, you go out, but yeah, like I, I started off more skeptical myself. Not, not that I didn't love the paranormal and not that I didn't have curiosity about, you know, cryptids and ghosts and, um, and aliens and things of like that. I've always been very curious, but I wondered, uh, you know, how real would the uh, paranormal part of things be? And so I tried to start off skeptical, not so much because I didn't want to believe, but kind of try to, so I could be very neutral. And if anything came to me, um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, uh, you know, jump the gun. I wanted to just kind of take it slowly, uh, and and but surely over time, it, you know, just things keep happening, and uh, you know, I'm definitely now know there's there's stuff out there that just cannot be explained. There's there's paranormal stuff that uh, under normal rules, um, there's no explanation. Um, somebody just informed me in the chat room, James. He was asking me a minute ago. If this was the five seasons show, and I told him, no, that was last Wednesday. He said, I quit putting dates on my show. <laughs> so I'm apologizing to him in chat, but I'm thinking I need to apologize in case somebody listening at YouTube or somewhere else hears this show. They've had the same problem. Uh, if that is the case, I want to apologize to everybody that uh, might have wondered when I was going to have a show, didn't know because I didn't put a date on it. I'll try to be more careful. I've had a bad habit of... Uh, when I'm posting shows, getting ahead of myself and meaning to post it. When I, by the time you get ahead, you think you already posted it and you didn't post it. If that makes any kind of sense. Sure, sure. Um, I'm I got one of those hyperactive minds and it thinks ahead of what I'm doing. In other words, it helps get things done sometimes, though, huh? Yeah, it does. But it also causes me to think I did things I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anybody's out there, if y'all ever catch one that don't have a date. 
feel free to email me, admin at talknowradio.com, and ask the date, or come ask in the chat room, post it to my forum, put it in my shop box, anywhere you can. I'll be more than happy to get a hold of you and give you all the date and go back behind myself and post everywhere the date, because I sure never intentionally leave a date off. So, coming back to what we were talking about, I'm sure that a man that has been around the world like you have, you have got to have had probably more ghostly stories to tell than most of the hunters that are just local. I mean, because you get to so many different places. Give somebody a really, really, really scary one you might have been to. Okay. And uh, and I appreciate the kind words. I, I, I have seen a lot of stuff. I don't know. If it's any better than anybody else, uh, I definitely think there's a lot of good people out there in their communities doing some great uh, paranormal investigation work. I, I, I think more often than not, there's there, this 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 field is full of really talented people. But to share with you a uh, one of my favorite incidents, um, uh, you know, last uh, what was it? Last March, I was down in the uh, Texas uh, border along uh, the Rio Grande Valley between Texas and Mexico, and there was an old World War II fort there, Fort Ringgold. And this is a uh, one after World War II, basically it became a hospital, and after it became a hospital, it became uh, the school, the elementary school, the junior high, the high school, the town. So it has this enormous history. And uh, what used to be the hospital, that's where they would take uh, tuberculosis patients after, um, you know, when that was kind of sweeping that area of, of the United States. And that more often than not, that's a disease they could not treat. So a lot of people passed away uh, from tuberculosis. So, in fact, so many bodies, basically, they just uh, built a uh, custom crematorium, and they would just take the bodies down there and, and set them on fire. But, um, you know, that's that's one of the locations where I've had one of the most amazing experiences as a paranormal investigator, because in that same crematorium, trying to reach out, uh, to anybody who might still be there, um, you know, I lit a candle. I, I did some of the stuff that you normally do as a paranormal investigator to get an intelligent response. You ask for a couple of knocks. Um, you ask for them to kind of repeat some activity you did to see if maybe there's something intelligent in there with you. And uh, just when I thought, you know, after 30 minutes, nothing was going on, I, I tried to leave. And one of the last things I did uh, in that in that session was I threw a, a little piece of metal into the corner of the room. It was very – there's a lot of junk in there now. Uh, you know, when it became a school, they started using the crematorium for storage. I threw a little item. It seemed to shatter some glass. I thought, you know, nothing's happening. I'm leaving. And as we're going out, you hear glass shatter again. And this is a good five minutes after I broke the glass. And I thought, well, uh, either some glass – been quite finished breaking for me or something's going on in there trying to get our attention so we went back in there uh i wanted to know if uh anybody had broken that glass because i had asked them to basically throw that object earlier got no response um i had a candle that i had lit because i thought maybe that that element of fire and this is you know the last thing these bodies experienced on, on earth was a flame if, if that would get an, an a response. I asked them if they wanted me to light the candle again, and that's when we had a disembodied voice say no. And uh, when I mean disembodied voice, that's basically uh, a voice from somebody with no body. There, there's a voice came out of you know the air. The air. Yeah, and this is not an EVP. This is not something that you know we had to look at a device later on to to hear it. This in the white nose. This was loud and clear as day. And there was three of us in there. A security guard, somebody using the camera for me on that particular day, and me. And we all heard, and you can see in the video, all of us respond instantly to the fact that we just heard a voice clear and loudly say no. And uh, the exciting part was that on on the audio and on the video, two different devices, the no was captured as well. Uh, the only difference being that the no was captured as a whisper. So, and that's a, what I've heard before with this in my voices. This was the first time I experienced one that loud that you can hear it loud, clearly, like a fourth voice in the room. And then if you capture an audio, it sounds like a whisper, which is a very interesting phenomenon on its own. But uh, there's not going to be anyone that 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 will be able to convince me that I didn't hear a disembodied voice talk to me that day because there's multiple witnesses. We heard it, we captured it, and um, and, and by my own personal 
um, you know, barometer. It was it was something real and paranormal. Sounds like it was something real and paranormal. <clears throat> Sounds like a lot of newcomers to the field might have gotten scared too on something like that. Uh, now, have you ever been to San Antonio? Oh sure, there's uh there's been a few investigations I've done in, in the San Antonio area. It's only about an hour away. Okay, now we got a question in the chat room. What's the difference between a disembodied voice and an EVP? Sure, that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, a disembodied voice is uh, basically a voice that you hear in real time with your with your ears. You know, no. Uh, equipment's necessary to hear it. Uh, so it's like, uh, somebody invincible is basically talking to you. And, uh, and, and you can record it, you know, that disembodied voice because it's, it's there, you're able to capture on the camera, you're able to capture on a recorder. Now, an EVP, that's an electronic voice phenomenon. That's when you don't hear it with your ears. It's, you only hear it after the fact. So you go back, you're reviewing uh, what you were recording with your video camera, you're recording what you're doing with your audio recorder, and there's a voice that wasn't there at the time you know you were doing your investigation. Uh, so uh, and, and those, there's a variety of EVPs. Some are uh, you hear the recorder and they're very clear. They're even as loud as everybody else talking. In the in the room at the time, I've, uh, that's why we call it Class A EVP. I captured one of those on the USS Hornet in uh, in Alameda, California. We captured a little girl talking a full a full sentence, loud, clearly, like somebody else in the room. And sometimes the EVPs are are whispers. Uh, in fact, so silent that you kind of have to really decide if it's just background noise that your recorder caught or a voice that you can just barely hear. Uh, but uh, electronic uh, EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, and uh, and uh, you know that's probably one of the most common pieces of evidence people catch. Hmm. Now, what I was fixing to ask before that question came in was, have you ever uh, investigated the Alamo? I've heard tell that place is on it. I've been to the Alamo on multiple locations, and this is one of the biggest, uh, I guess, I won't call it frustrations, but most common situations an investigator will come across. Um, you know, the, the more famous the location, the harder it is to get to investigate it under the conditions you, you'd want them in. So a place like the Alamo, uh, you know, that would be... Uh, It'd be a major accomplishment to try to convince them to let you investigate. So sometimes, as an investigator, you want to go. You have to go during you know public hours just to get inside the location. Uh, but then you'd be dealing with a lot of uh, contamination of the evidence. You know, a place with the Alamo. Whenever I've been there, there's a line around the block just to go in, and you stay in that line basically to the whole building. And with all that chatter, all those people talking, it'd be impossible to 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 capture any kind of evidence. Um, so, so the the more famous the place, the harder it is to investigate. Sometimes they just think that, you know, they they just don't want to open their doors to that to that type of stuff, or you know, to let people investigate after hours. Or if they do, it's 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 a very high, um, you know, amount of money to to be able to do that. A place like the Alamo would be very expensive to get to yourself after hours. Um, or if a place is haunted, but it's been on TV, then sometimes the owners go for a cash grab and they charge something from like six hundred, seven hundred dollars to two thousand dollars to investigate because they've been on TV. So usually I skip those. Uh, so it, what I've done in San Antonio has been, you know, kind of like places, where, um, small business owners, residential cases. Uh, where, where they open the doors and they're really more interested in knowing if anybody else can validate their paranormal experiences or capture their paranormal experiences than trying to make some money off of you trying to do it, to do an investigation. Yeah, there are a lot of people that, uh, even in residential homes, they end up being huge famous cases, whether they meant to or not. I mean, look at the, um, uh, one that ended up becoming the movie The Conjuring. Right, and that, and and the thing is, uh, you know, the paranormal community is pretty connected through social media these days, and and even some of the 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 aspects of that case was well known before the country movie even happened, and to the point where people are now arguing about, you know, how accurate the movie was based on their, you know, their their secondhand knowledge before the movie even existed. Uh, 
so, you know, for some residential cases, sure. The Amidville Horror, I mean, that's even going back further back, you know, uh, to, to that haunting when 